Okay, I think we're going to begin. And so welcome to the second week of Winter School. Uh, and to start out the second week, we of course have Juan Maldacina, who just arrived last night and is ready to go, mm -hmm. and is going to subject of his lecture, like some of the others, is quantum mechanics and space time. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this, uh, in these lectures, we'll see different topics in uh, different lectures. Today, uh, I'd like to talk about the Bekenstein bound. Um, and uh, we'll also talk a bit about the, the second law of black hole thermodynamics. Um, so, what is the Bekenstein bound? So, we know that uh, black holes have uh, some entropy. So, if we have a black hole, um, we, we know with some uh, horizon, so if they have an entropy, which is the area of the horizon over 4G Newton. Um, now, imagine that uh, we have a black hole and we have some matter outside. So let's say this is uh, some matter. And this matter has some entropy, so the entropy of the matter. I imagine that we take uh, this matter and we throw it into the black hole, right? So initially, we have uh, the black hole with some matter. And then in the end, we have a final black hole with no matter outside. So it looks like the entropy of the matter has uh, disappeared, right? So it was initially here, and it's not there in the final black hole. And at first sight, uh, it looks like uh, we are violating the second law of thermodynamics, because uh, the entropy of this of matter has disappeared behind the black hole horizon. Of course, that's not the end of the story because the this matter carries some energy, and when you throw it into the black hole, it will increase uh, the black hole mass, and therefore will also increase the black hole area. And so the question um, is whether the area increases enough to take into account. Uh, so the area increase should be such that it's bigger than such that when you put it in this formula, it's bigger than the entropy of the matter. In other words, what we would like to be true is that the change in the area of the uh, divided by 4G Newton, so this is the change in the entropy of the black hole, that should be bigger uh, or equal than the entropy of the matter that we threw in. Okay. Now, this... Uh, change in the area can be uh, computed from Einstein's equations um, and is related to the change in the energy, so the energy of the matter, let's say, divided by uh, the temperature of the black hole. So this is, this is the first law of uh, black hole thermodynamics. Uh, so for small changes in the mass of the black hole and so on, we have this uh, first law. So in other, in other words, if we increase the black hole mass by an energy E, uh, then the change in the area is uh, given by this formula. Okay. So then uh, this translates into the condition that the energy of this matter has to be bigger than uh, the entropy. Okay. So it's a condition on the energy of matter. And in order to understand better what this condition really means, so this is the energy as measured by an observer outside. It's what we would call the uh, Schwarzschild energy or uh, the asymptotic energy. In order to understand a little better what this means, we'll um, need to discuss uh, the, uh, the geometry of the black hole. So let me just... Uh, just so a general black hole will have, uh, of course, uh, so we'll have an isometry, which is this time translation symmetry. And, um, and we can generically write the, typically we write the metric in this way. And so the black hole horizon is at the place where f uh, of the horizon is equal to 0. Okay. And then we expand around uh, the horizon. And we can choose a variable to be, um, so the derivative of this function at the horizon. And this is uh, a variable rho, which is chosen in such a way that when we substitute it back uh, in this formula, 
uh, this term really will simply give us a plus um, the rho square, so that rho is actually the proper distance from the horizon. And if we do this, then we get here minus f prime squared over 4 times, um, times rho squared dt squared. Okay? And um, we can uh, define a, a new time coordinate so that this is minus rho squared d tau squared is there. Okay, so then, um, so this is, uh, this is a new time related to the previous one um, by this formula. And in this way, we see uh, the metric of uh, Rinder space. And um, okay, so uh, that's Rindler space. And we know that if we uh, make uh, this time Euclidean, so we send uh, tau to i tau Euclidean, then we get the metric of, uh, of Euclidean space. Okay. And if we demand that, um, that the origin is non-singular, then we get that this uh, tau Euclidean has period tau Euclidean plus 2 pi. Um, so in other words, uh, in Euclidean space, we have this uh, tau is really the, the angular coordinate, and rho is the radial coordinate. And while the angular coordinate is periodic, and if you take the period to be 2 pi, then the origin is completely smooth. Now, of course, uh, this is related to Rindler space. So this is the Lorentzian version, where we have rho is this radial coordinate, and tau uh, corresponds to the coordinate along uh, these fixed rho directions, which are uh, accelerating trajectories. Um, and the, the Euclidean continuation that uh, takes uh, tau to i tau Euclidean is actually essentially the same as the Euclidean continuation which uh, takes uh, this uh, coordinate uh, of Minkowski space, so x0 to i x0. So this is uh, i x0, so or x0 Euclidean, okay? And so, so the state uh, that we get here, so if we have a smooth uh, state everywhere in Minkowski space, um, that can be continued in Euclidean signature to the Euclidean plane. And in terms of these coordinates, then the, what originally was the, this tau coordinate becomes uh, this angular coordinate here. And its uh, periodicity means that we have a temperature. So here, uh, when in Euclidean time we have a periodic Euclidean time direction, we can think of that as a thermal, as a system in finite temperature. And the temperature is, uh, so beta is equal to, well, let me, uh, well, I guess I can erase this here. Um, in terms of the tau coordinate, um, the temperature uh, beta is equal to 2 pi. That's 1 over the temperature in the tau coordinate. Now notice that uh, in Euclidean space, this, this physical size of this circle is changing. And that means that the temperature is changing, the proper temperature is changing. And that's a generic property when we have uh, a thermal system in, uh, so if we have, uh, let's say, uh, a metric of this form. So imagine we have a, a metric where G00 depends on R, right? So that's a gravitational field in you can think of this as a relativistic analog of a gravitational potential. So we have a system in a gravitational potential in a situation where we have some time translation symmetry. Okay, we have a killing vector corresponding to shifts in tau, in time. And in this situation, imagine we have a system at finite temperature in thermal equilibrium. 
So we have a system in thermal equilibrium. Um, what um, is constant is um, the temperature. So temperature is essentially like energy. So we can measure energy with respect to various notions of time. So for example, we can uh, measure the energy that is conjugate to the time translation, to the global time translation. Um, and uh, energy is like, temperature is like time, it appears in the, uh, temperature is like energy, it appears in the partition function in this way. And so we can measure the temperature, let's say, with relative to this time t, and that temperature is constant. So this temperature in thermal equilibrium is constant. So it's the same everywhere in space-time. But the actual physical temperature, so the, pr the proper temperature, so the temperature measured by a, a thermometer at a given uh, position, is actually going to be this temperature measured with respect to this time, divided by the square root of the uh, gravitational potential. Okay? So when you are in a gravitational potential, the uh, temperature, the proper temperature depends on the position. Um, and so on. That's related to this physical time, uh, the, this, this, the fact that we can have the physical size depend on R. Um, okay, so um, in uh, this particular context of Rindler, we have that uh, the temperature uh, is given by this formula, or the proper temperature will be the 1 over 2 pi times this coordinate row that uh, we defined over here, okay? Um, or similarly, we can uh, compute, of course, we can get the usual formula for the black hole temperature by uh, writing T uh, measured with respect to this time, which will differ by this factor of F prime uh, compared to the previous uh, temperature. So we can just simply uh, relate the times in this way and we can compute the, the ratio between the proper temperature and uh, so which was 1 over 2 pi and then um, well temperature is like uh, 1 over d time so we uh, get um, something which uh, goes like f prime over 2 times uh, 1 over 2 pi okay, and that's the usual formula for the black hole temperature okay now, so all of this uh, is, of course, very well known. I'm just uh, reviewing uh, very well known facts. Um, so now uh, we'll review one more uh, well known fact. I'm making a small detour describing in detail uh, some aspects of Rinder space that uh, will be useful for understanding better this Bekenstein bound. Um, and so, one more uh, thing we would like to understand is. Uh, we like to describe a little better the. Um, let me let me save this formula for later. What something we want it to be true. So we wanted that E m over t equal to delta area over 40 newton should be bigger than S matter. And. So we've, we've seen that uh, when we think about uh, Rindler space, uh, we go to Euclidean space, we have the thermal circle. And that um, gives us that um, in terms of that, that time, we have a, a thermal state. So let me be a little more explicit about this. So imagine we have Rindler space. And um, we now... Um, decide that we are going to only make observations on uh, the right wedge, so on, on re what the coordinates, uh, on the part of the space covered by these coordinates, so the coordinate, the region where rho is bigger than zero and time is anything, so that those coordinates cover this uh, whole region of uh, Minkowski space. Um, this is called the Rindler wedge of Minkowski space. And if we... Um, restrict observations only to this region, the original state of the theory, which is the Minkowski vacuum. So there is initially uh, one particular state, which is the Minkowski vacuum defined everywhere in space. Um, that's a pure state. But if we only make measurements here, it will look to us as a mixed state. Um, 
And in fact, uh, we've seen that it looks like, like a thermal state with a specific temperature. And we'd like to be a little more explicit on what the density matrix is. Um, and so one way to understand what the density matrix is is the following. So suppose that uh, we take the field theory um, at uh, time equal to 0. So uh, we'll have some, this state will be some, we can think of it as a wave functional of the values of the field over the real line. So we have arbitrary values of the field on the real line. And for each set of field configurations, we have some probability distribution, um, some, some amplitude, some wave function. And um, OK, so that's uh, what we have. And now, but we are going to make observations only on the right uh, part, so for uh, x bigger than 0. And so we like to trace out over anything that can happen here, or any of the field values that we can have here. In other words, we would like to uh, construct the density matrix, which is essentially the uh, vacuum uh, of the original field theory. And then we take the trace over everything that happens to the left. Okay? So, and one way to uh, do this is to, um, to consider, let's say, one, one way to understand what this uh, wave function is, is to do Euclidean evolution um, up to ta Euclidean time equal to 0. And if we do that Euclidean path integral with arbitrary values for the field variable, we'll get uh, this wave function. That's uh, the standard prescription for finding the vacuum wave function. And so that uh, gives us this state. And to get this state, we can also do Euclidean evolution from the future. Um, so now we, we have a whole Euclidean time here in the past and also coming from Euclidean time in the future. Um, and then we... Uh, we trace over all these uh, field values. So in some sense, uh, what we have is now um, here we have some field values uh, on the right. We have some other field values on the top part. These are arbitrary. And so the density matrix is a function of the field values uh, of two field values. So because it's a, it's a matrix, it's a function of, so you could think of this as the indices of a matrix. So let's say row alpha, beta, where alpha and beta are uh, these uh, field configurations. And this is given by doing the path integral over all, you, all of Euclidean time with boundary conditions on the, with a slit here at uh, positive x. And on the bottom part of the slit, we put field configurations phi of x and phi prime of x in the top part of the slit. Okay? So that gives us a density matrix. And one other way of understanding this density matrix is to do Euclidean, uh, Euclidean evolution from here uh, to here. Okay. So this is equal to um, e to the minus 2 pi k. So k, you can think of this as the uh, boost generator the or the Euclidean rotation generator. Um, that gives us the Euclidean evolution by total length, which is 2 pi. Um, and then where we e evaluate this uh, matrix between field configuration phi of x prime uh, phi of x. Okay. So those are the matrix elements of uh, this Euclidean time evolution. What and is yeah, so k is the generator of uh, rotations in Euclidean time. Okay. Um, or is the same as the boost generator in Lorentzian signature. Um, the letter K is, uh, is sometimes used for, uh, for an arbitrary density matrix. Uh, there is something called the modular Hamiltonian, which uh, is simply defined to be the log of the density matrix with this factor of 2 pi. Okay? In this particular case, this uh, K is, actual, is actually well the rotation generator and has an expression um, in terms of uh, the stress tensor. So we can write it as, for example, as an integral over, so if you think about the boost generator, the rotation generator, it can be written as an integral of the stress tensor over this line. So between 0 and infinity, dx of x times uh, t0, 0 of x, for example. So on that line, uh, it has uh, this particular expression. We can write the expression, of course, we can integrate either on this line, or since the stress tensor is conserved, we can integrate on any 
space-like surface. I'm here pointing out this integral. Of course, if there are transverse dimensions, we also integrate over d minus 2 of the transverse dimensions. Um, let me not uh, indicate this explicitly. Um, of course, uh, it's sometimes useful to, if, if we think about one of the null coordinates, so let's say x plus, for example, then uh, this can also be written as the integral between 0 and infinity, dx plus, uh, x plus, d plus plus of x. Okay. That's an alternative expression for this modular Hamiltonian that we'll also use later. Now, um, in general, if you uh, define a density matrix by restricting your fields to a subregion, um, it will the you can always define the modular Hamiltonian in this way. Um, however, it generically will not have a simple local expression as we have here. So that's a very special feature of a half space. Okay? And it's related to the fact that um, <coughs> we can, um, well, in Euclidean space, we can have this uh, rotation, which is actually a symmetry of the original uh, system. Um, now this uh, is, so this whole discussion is true for any field theory, whether interacting or free, is completely generic, and it's true for any relativistic uh, field theory. So it's a general prediction about uh, relativistic uh, field theory that if we move, for example, along an accelerating trajectory, we'll see a thermal, uh, well, we will have a thermal state and we'll get thermal predictions. Okay, and of, of course in the case of Minkowski space, this is the so-called Unruh, um, Unruh effect, the fact that uh, an accelerated observer sees uh, a temperature. And in fact, uh, this, this description, uh, this type of description, based on uh, the symmetries of the theory, especially the boost symmetry, was in fact given before by Bisoniano and Bichmann um, but they were so mathematical they didn't even realize that it meant that an accelerated observer would see a temperature. So it was later after Hawking discovered his effect that <coughs> Unruh realized that this is what was going on. So we have that an accelerated obs accelerating observer sees a temperature, which is the acceleration divided by 2 pi. Now this is all very well known probably to most of you and hopefully. But now let me ask you a question. So Imagine we are here, this is the Earth, okay, and we are, we are standing here uh, on the surface of the Earth, and we are feeling some acceleration due to gravity, okay? And let's imagine that uh, we are, at, let's say, at very low temperatures, much lower than the one we are at right now. So the question is whether this observer sees a temperature. Does this observer see a temperature which is uh, equal to g divided by 2 pi? He's standing, he's standing, like we are standing. So we are standing, we let the temperature of the Earth go down, 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 as far down as you possibly go. Will it go as far down as this temperature? This is a very low temperature, we'll compute it in Well, let, let's, let, let's, let's maybe have a vote. How many people think that in this situation we'll see a temperature which is g over 2 pi? And how many people think uh, the temperature will be zero? So those who know science also is supposed to... What? Well, just, just think what you would. If you don't dare raise, you raise don't your see, hand. You don't see anything. What? You do not see anything. No temperature. Yeah. Any temperature, yeah. So you would see no temperature. Yeah. Now, we are very used to the principle of equivalence, which says that uh, an accelerating observer and an observer in a gravitational field should see the same thing. So here we seem to have uh, some conflicting. So some, some people are willing to say that the principle of equivalence is violated, apparently. Um, now, who do you think? Uh, I, I, do you want to change your answers? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's, let's just look again at Rindler space. 
And so we had this accelerating observer in Rindler space. Um, and let's pick this trajectory so that it has acceleration g, OK? Eternally. Eternally, yeah, acceleration g, OK? So we see that far enough from the center so that uh, the acceleration is g. So the metric uh, that this guy, the space time that this guy sees, so let's say at uh, some small region uh, for all times, is going to be very similar to the space time in this region around this trajectory. Okay? Right? Um, so the space time is actually the same, the metric is almost the same. And a naive application of the principle of equivalence would naively say that uh, he should also see a temperature. Um, however, there is a small detail, which is a very important detail here. And let's, uh, so we, we are always talking about this temperature, but what's the associated thermal wavelength of, um, associated to this temperature? And so, of course, this is uh, like, I'm, I'm trying to calculate this wavelength lambda in physical uh, sizes. And for an acceleration g of the acceleration of gravity on the uh, surface of the Earth, lambda is uh, a few light years. So you can compute it by putting back the units, the units of, um, of g and uh, so, and C and so on. So, so you need to put in, uh, sorry, you need to put in H bar uh, and, uh, and C in such a way that uh, the thing has the right units and you find that lambda is a few light years. And, okay. So, so that's what we find. And so what we conclude is that the metric, so even though that the metric near the trajectory is the same in Rindler, so near this region, is the same in this Rindler region as it is in the Earth, in the case of the metric in this region is not the same. Okay? So if we were to extrapolate the metric far, further away, here we go down and we find the center of the Earth and so, and so on, and, and that distance corresponds to a distance uh, roughly uh, here, very, very far from here because this distance is a light year. Okay, so the metric is really different here, and if the metric is different, then the temperature uh, does not need to be uh, what we compute. Does not need to be g over two pi. Uh, so the the temperature is given by this formula only when uh, the met the metric is actually the metric of flat space all the way to the horizon. Okay, if there is something else here like a mirror, for example, or a different geometry, or and so on then the temperature doesn't have to be given by the acceleration. So this effect, uh, this thermal effect, is essentially a non-local effect. And in order to be able to trust it, you need to be able to have this uh, metric being flat space all the way up to the horizon. Okay? So it, the, the space time has to be the same for a distance which is of the order of the thermal wavelength. The thermal wavelength is of the order of the distance to the horizon. Okay. What? Well, here we are discussing this effect in um, Minkowski space. Yes. But the, uh, if yes. The earth was heavy. If the earth, yeah, if there was an actual horizon, right? So if instead of having this, we have, um, well, if we had a black hole here in the center, right? Um, and you are standing far away at the region where the acceleration is g, right? Then you would see the temperature. But that would be a situation where you actually have the horizon. The thing that I'm emphasizing here is that you actually need this horizon. And you need to have space time, let's say at least in this derivation, be smooth at the horizon in order to have um, this effect. So we... Well, you could kind of see the foreign of the whole, oh, yes. the whole uh, stress with the radius. 10% more than the yes, black yes, holes. And yes. G is very large. Very it's large very large. Yeah. Order, but nevertheless, you see also mass. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you really, so you have a neutron star where the, uh, you know, the redshift is of order 70%. Uh, you still 
it could be at zero temperature, and you see nothing. There is no radiation. The so No, the crucial point is the presence of a horizon. And because it vanishes yes. in the center of the Earth, acceleration. Yes. So it's not homogeneous in the whole space-time. Yeah, yeah, so the metric is changed, and so here it, it's like having a mirror. So the situation of the, with the Earth is the same as having space-time ending here. So we only have this portion of space-time, and uh, you don't have the horizon and all these other features. Yes? Uh, uh, the existence of horizon is a global statement. There are many ways of finding not having a horizon. Yeah. And one of them is actually if you just start mm -hmm. at red, accelerate, and then go back to an inertial plane. Yes, yes. Right, right. So if you accelerate long enough so that uh, if you accelerate for a time of a few years, then you will see the radiation for those few years. And then, then after that, you will not see it anymore. So you, you, you need to, uh, at least to have it approximately for a time comparable to the wavelength. Um. What? Yes, yes. But, but the geometry does not have a horizon because it's like having a mirror. So for that reason, we won't see this temperature. Of course, our temperature is much bigger than, than, than this, the thermal wavelength. Of, um, OK. Like a mirror? Well, I mean, if you think of what happens with the geometry as you go down, right? At some point here, uh, the, uh, the whole spherical slices shrink to zero, right? And you cannot go further down than here, right? So space, this radial direction ends at the center. So here, that radial direction is this direction where the gravitational potential is uh, going down, right? And, uh, and it ends at some position. So it's similar to having a mirror, where you cannot go further to the left. Yeah. No, it's our time. So if, if, we, if we accelerate it, so if we are in empty space and we accelerate for a few years, then in principle you would be able to see this uh, effect. And also by the way, it means that free falling observer, mm -hmm. you'll see one root temperature. If you are able to throw the things and go down, if you'll see one root temperature. Here, the guy who is oscillating, well. I don't oscillate and I can just fall down on the earth before I go reach ground. Yes. Okay, it's normal acceleration. Yes, yes. Well, well, I mean, this, this, this guy is in free fall, but also um, no, he's free. This guy. Ah, the guy in free fall, you see, of course, temperature, but it will depend on uh, acceleration. If it's not well, the guy, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's oscillating. He will say something different that you'll have to calculate, but yeah. I, I don't know if a simple right. formula. Uh, for instance, yes. distance 10 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Down yeah. And then mm -hmm. you see temperature, which corresponds to. Well, you, you're, you're falling down for a very short time, uh, and uh, this, temp yeah, this temperature. Yes, you will not, of course, yeah. uh, uh, register this thing. But on the neutron star, in principle, uh, you could do this experiment. Yeah, you, you, you could see something. Yes. But I, I think, I'm not sure if there is a universal formula. Temperature, yes, no, no, notice, no, notice that the time you are accelerating right. over is, is shorter than this. Yeah, but so and it's difficult uh, to measure. But your detector will be excited. Yeah, it could be excited. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. That's right. Excited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Indeed. If, if I'm accelerating for a few years, that is yeah. to say I have zero temperature, yes. but then I can stop accelerating. Yes. There is no horizon, so yeah. horizons are not crucial. No, no, it's not crucial. It's crucial that there is an approximate horizon during the time where you are accelerating. And you're, you should be accelerating over time comparable to the temperature. I mean, in order to, to measure such a low temperature, it will take you a long time to measure uh, such a low temperature, right? That's, w that's also why you need a few years from the energy uncertainty principle, energy time uncertainty principle. OK, now, um, now with all this digression, let me, let's uh, go back to uh, the Bekenstein bound discussion. So we were discussing a black hole. So now we go back to the Bekenstein bound discussion. And we have some matter here. 
um, that is in the near horizon region. So it's very, let's say, close to the horizon of the black hole, and then we'll throw it in. Um, and so we can approximate the geometry near this region as the geometry of Rindler space. Okay? And then uh, if we do that, then the quotient that appears there in the right-hand side, energy of matter divided by the temperature, can be similarly computed as, uh, just by a change in time as the energy measured with respect to the time tau of Rindler space. Re remember that that's the time where the metric uh, had this form, right? That's just a simply a rescaling factor divided by the temperature uh, also measured with respect to the same time. And this temperature was 2 pi, and this time was just the boost uh, generator of uh, Minkowski space. Okay? So now, uh, of Rindler space. So now we have uh, the left-hand side written in terms of uh, Rindler space. And so what we want is that uh, 2 pi k should be bigger, or the k of the matter, should be bigger than the entropy of the matter. And this is an inequality purely in Rindler space, in flat space. OK? So that's the thing which uh, we would like to be true. OK? So black hole thermodynamics implies uh, a condition that involves uh, purely flat space or fields in flat space with no gravity. There is no G Newton in this expression. There was a G Newton here. But using Einstein's equations, we've removed it. Um, and we have a condition which purely involves flat space. So that's, uh, that's the Bekenstein bound. And Bekenstein further uh, then tried to say uh, that uh, if uh, the matter is at some distance r, then this boost generator would be the Minkowski energy E Minkowski. So this could be thought of as the E Minkowski times r approximately, right? Times the distance, that's the boost uh, generator for this, eigenvalue for this configuration. But we will not need, the, actually, the more precise version of the bound is to think of it. It's better to think of it in, this, in these terms, and we'll continue to do that. Now notice that typically this is very well uh, obeyed for ordinary matter. Because if we have, let's say, for example, a massive particle here at some distance uh, d, right? So then uh, this, uh, this will be, so in this case, uh, this will be a good approximation. So k will be of the form d times m. And for any distance which is bigger than the Compton wavelength of the particle, the Compton wavelength is 1 over m, right? So for any distance which is bigger than 1 over m, this would be much, much bigger than 1, right? Um, so the, this side would be much, much bigger than 1, and the entropy of this particle well, will uh, be, in general, small. Um, OK, so in general, uh, let me put in also the units. So if we put in the h bar and the c, this uh, has a c in the numerator and an h bar in the denominator saying that uh, in the limit, the classical limit where h bar goes to 0, this goes to infinity. Or uh, in the non-relativistic limit, when c goes to infinity, it also goes to infinity. Right? So in order for it to be finite, it, you, you need some relativistic effects and uh, also quantum mechanical effects. So you okay. this, is this just our good luck? This is, this, this, this is a question. So, so far, I'm just saying that, uh, well, it, uh, yeah, it, it looks good. And so it's our good luck that field theory behaves so it could be coupled to a black hole? Uh, well, we, we, we haven't proven it yet. I, yeah, maybe my, my, this presentation has been slightly disorganized. So let me try to say what we discussed so far. What we discussed so far is that uh, black hole, consistency of black hole thermodynamics implies that uh, this inequality should be obeyed. And uh, all that I'm saying here is that in the classical limit or in the non-relativistic limit is obeyed well. Okay. Again, now, assuming that there's only one kind of yeah, one kind. We'll we'll discuss. Yeah. So naively, yeah. I was planning. So if, if you, for example, have many species of particles, so let's say n species, so the or a particle with very high spin of order n, 
then naively it looks like you can violate it because the right the left hand side will be fixed but this will be the logarithm of n and and by taking n large enough you will violate this bound so this is called the species problem and was one reason why people thought this bound didn't make uh, might not make sense or or that perhaps uh, this bound implied a new condition on field theory okay so what we will discuss now is we'll try to understand the precise version of this bound a more precise version than what we discussed so far uh, which is actually obeyed for, by any uh, field theory. And the discussion that I will follow from now on was uh, in a paper by Cassini, and there was some previous work by uh, Sorkin and also by Marolf, Minnick, and Ross um, that also led to this. So, okay. So, in, in order to, uh, to understand this a little bit better, we have to realize that. Uh, the quantities that appear here are not really well defined in the quantum theory. And the reason is that uh, states in the quantum theory cannot be uh, localized in space. So having quantum field theory, you have states are very delocalized. Uh, so, and we cannot assign an entropy to, let's say, a particle that is at some position. We can assign an entropy to some region or within some region. And we'll discuss uh, this a, a little better. So, but before discussing it a little better, let's, um, let's go back to the original derivation and do the original derivation a little better. So, um, so what we're going to discuss now is the, this Bekenstein bound in the full quantum theory. And we'll first need to formulate the, uh, a more precise version of the bound, and then we'll discuss the proof of this, that more precise version. So if we think about the entropy of a black hole, so let, let's recall the original derivation, the derivation we just saw. So the entropy of the black hole we said was the area divided by 4G Newton. But in the quantum theory, we also have to take into account the entropy of the quantum fields outside the black hole. So the, these, these fields are in a thermal state, and we need to take into account the, uh, that entropy. <coughs> That's sometimes called the, well, the von Neumann entropy of the fields outside or the thermal state outside. This is sometimes called the, also sometimes called the entanglement entropy. It's called entanglement entropy because if you think about, for example, the eternal black hole uh, diagram, then we have a pure state at t equal to zero. And this entropy we are discussing is coming from the entanglement of um, well, the, the entanglement present in the ground state between the left side and the right side. Okay. When we have a black hole, we are only going to be me making measurements outside the black hole, and so uh, the state, so we're not measuring anything on the left, and the state that was pure on this whole time slice looks like a mixed state, and we are just computing that entropy, and that context is sometimes called entanglement entropy. But, yes? It's not the first term. Yeah, so the first term is something we get from gravity, and the second term is something we get from the quantum field theory in this uh, background. So this is the quantum correction to the original black hole entropy. So we have the original black hole entropy, and this is the quantum correction to the black hole entropy. It's supposed to be in thermal equilibrium, the whole thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, in this case, yes. you are considering the space, the swimming corpse key asymptotic spaces, which are related so-called Yes, yes. Now yes. ah, you are going to this direction. No, no, well, but so even, right. if, if, even if we consider the collapsing black hole, so okay. There is no uh, right, so if we have a collapsing black hole, this is the star that is collapsing, and, and then it, it is true that there is no second region, yeah. but the idea is that the state uh, very late, uh, at this, this very late time, yeah. will be very similar to the state uh, here, right? And here, yes, and, and now we are talking about the entanglement between the, this region and the interior, right? Or this region and the, and the exterior, okay? So we are just simply only making observations over this region, and because we are not making observations here, we uh, get... But it's not when you are calculating, so the same thing as to calculate entanglement, yes. taking left compared to right, yeah, because uh, you know that 
one case, you have a synthetic <coughs> Kelly-Minkowski space. Uh, uh, okay, let, 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 let me clarify this. So if, if you just make observations everywhere here, yeah. there is, uh, of course, you, can, you have access to the full pure state, and there is no entanglement entropy, okay, in the exact theory. But if you say that I'm going to make observations only at times later than this, right? Mm -hmm. Later than this, let's say, slice, and, and to the future. So we make observations only within this region. Then uh, we'll have uh, this entanglement entropy. And that's the one we are talking about. Yes, but when yeah. you are doing this particular slice, uh, this one, yeah. on eternal black hole diagram, yes. then this second calculation will be much more difficult than the first calculation. I mean, when you are taking hypersurface U equal zero, I mean, no, no, not this one. I mean, original one, L, R, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, this, this one is the, this yeah, this one is a simple, relatively simple calculation. It's very simple calculation, yeah. but the other one is uh, difficult. Yeah, this one, yes, but then uh, you argue that um, this, uh, this other one will give you essentially the same answer as this one. Um, yes. Yes. So this uh, this is an expansion in powers of G Newton. So there is an order G Newton terms here that we are not computing. Um, yeah. This this would include also the thermal gravitons, and I'm not discussing the fact that it is uh, there is a UV diversions here. That's supposed to be cancelled by some counter terms. Let me let me. Uh, one loop, uh, yeah, this is the one loop correction. So, it, a, a, a one way to one alternative way to compute this is to think about uh, the Euclidean uh, computation of the entropy. So, uh, the Gibbons Hawking, and. Um, there, the classical result, of course, uh, agrees with this. And here you can compute the one-loop determinants for all fields. They're all finite and so on. Uh, well, there are counter terms. You put all the counter terms. You renormalize the theory in curve space as usual. And uh, from those determinants, you get the one-loop correction. Right? And that one-loop correction has a piece that uh, can be viewed at this, as this entanglement entropy. Uh, the whole thing is finite. And it has other pieces which can be viewed as quantum corrections to the black hole area and so on. Uh, so if you are going to actually do the computation, uh, it's more convenient to sometimes do it this way. And people who have actually done computations like Sen, who computed Sen and collaborators who computed corrections to black hole entropies for near extremal black holes, they've, they've done it this way. Um, but this other way of thinking about the calculation will be particularly useful for other purposes here. And, yeah. Um, well, that's the entropy of the radiation outside, yes. Yes. Um, and that entropy, in principle, is uh, is larger than uh, could be larger than the the black hole entropy. Uh, so because, well, w this um, if we are in the in thermal equilibrium, yeah. uh, this in principle includes the entropy of the whole gas outside the black hole, and it's infinite. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, ignoring the fact that this uh, is thermal all the way to infinity. Or we could be in, for example, in ADS, where there is a gravitational potential, and then you get the finite answer outside. Um, so that's for a black hole, which is, is in actual thermal equilibrium. You'll get the finite answer. Um, OK. So this is just the entropy of the thermal atmosphere of the black hole. So it's the, the entropy of the, all the modes outside, even the ones that do not make it to infinity. So you are computing there, and they also contribute to the entropy. Um, okay, so this this entropy outside is just uh, can be viewed as minus trace of rho log rho, where rho is the density matrix of the uh, quantum fields outside the black hole. The black hole. Okay. Um, so now let's go back to uh, the Bekenstein thought experiment. And we had the black hole with some matter outside. Um, and then we also had the black, black hole after the matter went in. 
where outside we have the density matrix of the vacuum. And here we have a different density matrix, which is the density matrix of the vacuum plus the plus matter, right? So it's a different density matrix. Notice we don't say that we have a pure state, which is the vacuum, and here. So we are just thinking about the outside, and the outside is some density matrix, which is the vacuum thermal density matrix. And here we have a deviation from that, that density matrix. Um, so the total change uh, in entropy, delta S total, which uh, contains uh, both changes. So there is two things will change in these two configurations. So we had some initial area, area initial, and some area final of the black hole after the matter went in. So the total change in entropy will be the change in area over 4G Newton. And uh, minus, well, the change in entropy. So the entropy of the density matrix rho minus the entropy of the vacuum. So this is, uh, this is how the entropy outside changed, OK? Um, so here we had the entropy of the density matrix, uh, and we don't have that one here. Um, well, the problem is I'm, I'm being a little, OK. Let me, let me be more clear. Um, so this is A final minus A initial, right? And then this is S final minus S initial, right? S final is this one, right? That's why it has a plus sign. And S, S initial is this one, that's why, that's why it has a minus sign. Um, OK, so we'll call this the, uh, the change in entropy between the state with density matrix rho and the one with density matrix the vacuum. So that's the change in uh, von Neumann entropy outside. And this change in the area, we already related it to, um, to well, delta, the change in energy divided by the temperature. And in the near horizon region, we could relate this to uh, 2 pi times the change in the modular Hamiltonian, or the change in the boost, uh, boost generator. So now we have a, an inequality in Rindler space, which says that uh, if we have two states in Rindler space, uh, we want uh, this to be true. Okay, so we are asking whether this is true. So we have two states which are, so now, now we went back to Minkowski space and we are in uh, Rindler. We're considering the, um, uh, a Rindler wedge, right? And on this Rindler wedge, we have two states, one with uh, density matrix rho and one with density matrix rho vacuum. And of course, the vacuum density matrix is just proportional to e to the minus 2 pi k, right? That's the one we discussed before. And this is a different one. So the different one is when we have some matter here. We have some additional matter. And we have, uh, of course, the matter might be not localized. We might have matter also on the left side and so on. But uh, this inequality only refers to the density matrix on the right, right side. <coughs> OK, so we, we like to, so now this is a well-defined uh, condition. Uh, this is uh, a well-defined condition. Notice that uh, this, this von Neumann entropies associated to subregions, they typically have UV divergences uh, because of all the modes, all the high energy modes near the horizon. Recall that the temp proper temperature was growing and it went to infinity at the horizon, and for that reason, uh, we have a UV diversions, but we have the same UV diversions. That UV diversions is universal, independent of the state, as long as this is a reasonable state in the whole Minkowski space. Uh, the diversions will be the same and will cancel in this expression. Um, there is no black hole now. So now we have a statement purely Minkowski space. So we started motivating this from the black hole point of view. Um, but we translated uh, these conditions on the black hole geometry and the entropy near the, of matter near the black hole into a condition in flat space. So now we have flat space. And in flat space, we would like this to be true. But you trace over some part of the space line, right? Yeah, so in flat space, we trace over the left, uh, over the left uh, Rindler wedge. So that's what I mean by the black hole horizon. Ah, OK. Yeah, so yes.
Yes. Yeah. So so now now yeah. So now this got translated into a completely, uh, let's say, static uh, situation. There is nothing dynamical here. We have some state. So of course, this matter can move in and out of this region and so on, right? So the matter could be doing this. But what we are doing is we are just considering the matter in this region. We're considering all possible measurements we can make here. They, uh, the state will be characterized by these dense two density matrices, one for the non-vacuum and one for the vacuum. And we would like this to be true. Uh, for the right hand side still has the log n, right? Well, we'll, we'll get to the species in, a, in just a second. Um, um, well, may, may, maybe I could start addressing the species. May, maybe I'll, since you're asking, I'll just address the species issue now. So, so the species issue had to do with the with the situation where we um, where we have a massive particle here, let's say, at some distance d, and so then the the right hand side here will be m d, and the, here we'll have a log n of the number of species, right? And it appears that we can violate the, the issue, the problem. But what we should remember is that. Uh, this is a thermal state. And if we say we have one particle here, we could also, um, so one particle of some species, the unknown species, that's why we got the log n. Uh, we could also have excitations from the vacuum. So we could have pairs that are created from the vacuum. Um, and so if we say that initially, so we, in order when, when we calculate this entropy as being log n, we are imagining just a single particle computation where we have this one particle, and if it had one species in the beginning, it has that, that species that we uh, then have n different possibilities for it. But if we have a, a gas of particles here, um, then we would need to do a multi-particle computation. Now, when is the single particle computation correct? That single particle computation is correct when, um, when the probability of exciting any other particle is small. What's the probability of exciting any other particle? Well, with n, we have n species of particles times the thermal factor. Um, so this is the, the proper temperature, let's say, at uh, distance d is uh, 1 over d. That's why we got this. And this should be much smaller than 1 in order for the single particle computation to be correct. Right? So this, this computation of the entropy is <coughs> correct only in this uh, regime and also this computation of the energy. Otherwise, we need to include the energies of all the other particles. And it turns out that if you do the correct com multi-particle uh, computation, you actually uh, the, you don't get the log n anymore. So, um, Why you don't get log n if you do multi-particle uh, You don't get the log n because you, well, um, in the regime that this is, uh, let's say, much bigger than 1, yeah. right? Um, what happens is that uh, you'll see in a second why. So let me let me just uh, because I'll first argue why it is true in general, and then you'll see why it has to be has to work. But well, in short, it's because the the state with the extra particle is less distinguishable from the vacuum, because you have all these thermal, uh, all these other particles that could be excited, and it's harder to distinguish between the two states. Um, so there is extra degeneracy. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so that's uh, the inequality that we want to be true. And now let's uh, expand it a little more. Um, so we have the two density matrices rho and rho vacuum. Um, and so here we'll have. Uh, trace of um, k times rho uh, minus trace of k times rho vacuum, right? This is just simply the, the delta k. And this is supposed to be bigger or equal than uh, the entropy. So one is minus trace rho log rho, and the other one is plus uh, trace rho vacuum times log rho vacuum. Right? Um, now, remember that uh, rho vacuum uh, had this expression we discussed uh, in terms of the uh, 
that means that uh, 2 pi k is uh, equal to minus uh, log rho plus some constant. Okay. Um, so this is proportional to because there is a normalization condition. And so this is uh, 2 pi k is equal to this. So we'll now insert this expression here. Um, and then, so from the first term, we get uh, trace uh, minus trace uh, rho log rho vacuum. And from here, we get plus uh, trace rho vacuum log rho vacuum, right? And this is supposed to be bigger or equal than the right-hand side. Now, this term is the same as the one we had here. So we just cancel this. And um, what we want is that uh, now we put this in the left-hand side. We now have trace of uh, rho log rho divided by rho vacuum, OK? Here we've uh, noticed we have rho here in the prefactor. And in one term, we have log rho. Here we have log rho vacuum with the opposite sign. So we have this expression. So this is what we want, OK? And it turns out that uh, this inequality is true for any two density matrices. So in any uh, quantum theory, uh, if we have density matrices, um, uh, two arbitrary density matrices in any system, in a finite dimensional system, in any system whatsoever, uh, you can argue in general that this inequality should be obeyed. Okay. So this is true for any true in any uh, quantum theory. including uh, sub-regions of relativistic field theories, okay? where, um, where these are somewhat ill-defined because of the UV divergences. But this quantity is typically finite and bigger or equal than 0. And it's equal to 0 only when rho and uh, rho vacuum are actually the same. Okay? So in, for, let's say, a finite dimensional system, you can uh, prove that uh, this is actually equal to 0 only if the two density matrices are actually equal. Okay. So going back to uh, your question about the species, um, so you see that uh, the reason that this is obeyed, so it just traces back to this issue. And then if you try to actually do the computation in the relativistic field theory, it's a particular case of this, and you'll find that uh, it, is, it will end up being obeyed. This is sometimes it drops, called. It drops completely, or there is something corresponding? What? Yeah. In the final result, dependence on n drops completely. Yeah, so in, in, in the. No, no, the, the, the logarithmic term drops. Out. So if, if, you take the, if you take the. Yeah, so one calculation you can do is you, you take the Rinder density matrix, or, or the. You, you can take the ordinary Minkowski vacuum and you can act, act with the creation operator of one of these particles with some energy. Um, and then compute uh, both uh, row and row vacuum and so on. And you'll find that, uh, of course, it's much bigger recon than zero as usual. And so there will not be any species problem. And if uh, the energy of this guy is such that you are in the regime where you will naively, in the naive uh, computation, you violate the Bekenstein bound, um, then uh, you find that there is no log n. Uh, um, Um, well, here he, you, you can change. Uh, so this, this inequality is general for any two rho and rho b. And, um, and yeah, so it's. it's, it's yeah, so he, here, so, yeah, from the. So this is called the relative entropy. And it's a kind of measure between. Uh, it's a measure of how different uh, two density matrices are. How easy it is to mistake, let's say, one state for the other. So if this is very large, then it's, it's difficult to mistake one, one for the other. Um, and this is true generically. Now, in order to relate it to the Bekenstein bound, we, we use some properties of rho b. In particular, we use this, uh, this expression okay, in order to relate it to this notion of energy. So here we have the notion of energy. And the reason uh, that uh, we could go back to this notion of energy is because of the uh, special property, the special form of the vacuum density matrix. Yes? Did we start around the motivation from the case, from the case of the black hole, and we went to the flat space case? 
Yes, yes. Um, well, I mean, he, here when we talk about, uh, so first of all, we are talking about the Rindler region of flat space. And the Rindler region uh, is in a mixed state. So when we talk about the entropy and so on, it's non-zero because we, we are looking only at a sub-sector, a, a sub-region of the regional space. But in this case, if I'm infinitely far away. Yeah, you are infinitely far away. Yeah, so if you're infinitely far away, you are going to be measuring even less than the, what this guy who, is, uh, who has access to the whole region can measure, right? So here, when we talk about this density matrix, it uh, involves observations done anywhere. So we can have an observer that collects data from here, from here, from ev every point in space-time. If you further restrict to, to, to let's say, only measures, measurements very far away, uh, then you will have a different density matrix. It will, it, will have a, um, it will be even more mixed. You are tracing over more stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm being clear. Yes, Gary? So you seem to be saying that yes. um, when you do this calculation, yes. you use a general proxy of all matter that you do analogous mm -hmm. to the positivity of energy or the dominant energy conditions which are needed to arrive in the gravitational in terms of the area. You also seem to be saying that with this uh, paradox, mm -hmm. mathematically false, if you want to fit in your theory, because this is just depending on the basic functions. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so he, he, here, here we, yeah, so this is true in any, so here what we use this, uh, this is true in any quantum theory. Uh, the relation between rho b and k is uh, that local expression is true in relativistic quantum field theories. So here what we used uh, to prove this is uh, quantum field theory or relativity, relativity plus quantum mechanics and it will be true in any quantum field theory. So in, in other words the consistency of black hole thermodynamics, at least this, this, this Bekenstein type consistency condition, uh, does not require any condition on the quantum field theory. It only requires that it is a standard unitary and relativistic uh, quantum field theory. Um, and it's automatically obeyed in all systems. The difference between the two observers here is that they have different accelerations. When you say an observer was far away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these two observers have different accelerations. Um, and also, when, when, we, when we talk about this von Neumann, uh, this, this von Neumann entropies and so on, we are imagining that we have access to observations everywhere, right? Of course, you could be an observer here who sends uh, robots and explores this region and then receives the robots, right? And of course, such uh, observers then are also having access to this region. But we're imagining we have access to observations every, everywhere in this uh, causal region. Okay. Yeah, th this, this is not proving black hole thermodynamics to all orders in the G Newton expansion. No, no, no. This is. Oh, yes, yes. This is, this is true to all orders of loops in the interacting theory. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is true uh, about uh, this type of terms in black hole thermodynamics. So there is true about uh, black hole thermodynamics to order G Newton to the zeroth power, right? So we're independent of G Newton. Um, the. The fact that the area increases classically follows from the classical positive energy condition. And, and then this, uh, in the quantum, so at order g newton to the zero, it follows from uh, this uh, Bekenstein, Bekenstein bound. I mean, I haven't exactly argued that yet, but uh, you, can, you can also uh, show by similar techniques that you have the second law of thermodynamics holds. Uh, at order g newton to the zero. This was argued by Aaron Wall. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, what time is it? Yeah, I guess I won't have time to discuss it. Let me, uh, any other questions? Uh, what would happen if the system would be, let's say, a black hole, yes. a Schwarzschild black hole? Yes. The small thing? Yes. So it wouldn't <coughs> obey quantum field theory. How would you? 
Um, well, the, the whole discussion of black hole thermodynamics implies uh, that we have uh, an expansion in powers of G Newton. So it involves first the classical term, which is bigger than the quantum corrections and so on. If you're in a regime where this term is comparable to this one, then you don't know really how to do the calculation, <laughs> at least not from the gravity side. You might have a dual description, let's say through ADS CFT, and you might be able to, to do the calculation in some other way, but uh, not through this expansion. Uh, we, we, we don't know how to, from the gravity side, do the computation, which is not this one. Um, OK, so. Um, as, uh, so some further remarks about this. I mean, you, you, you can try as an exercise to prove this first for diagonal density matrices using the properties of the log, uh, and then for off-diagonal ones. You can, for example, uh, try to prove this by uh, varying over these density matrices and taking the derivative. And uh, Anyway, so that's one technique to prove it if you want. Oh, one, one general thing one could say is that um, even if you had a system which uh, a general quantum mechanical system, you could say you define k to be the log of the of rho b of the vacuum one, and then this inequality, of course, would be true. Well, but it's kind of trivial. Yeah. yeah. What does this inequality mean from the point of view of the properties of eigenvalues of the density matrices, rho and rho b, or you cannot compute with this very easily? Well, they, they don't commute, but you can. Uh, yeah, but uh, you can diagonalize them and then say, and then like, yeah. what, what it would mean that some of the eigenvalues are broader? Uh, or you didn't look at it. When you wrote this inequality, rho, log trace rho, log rho divided by rho uh, b, yeah. Uh, uh, what do you think would mean for the eigenvalue? Um, well, let me see. Well, well, the, 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 well, first of all, the eigenvalues are arbitrary. So you can take, so the rho and rho b can have arbitrary eigenvalues, right. Right. and the inequality will still be true, right? You mean for an so it, yeah, yeah. So you take, you take some density matrix. Let, let's say you take some matrix. Let's say one half, uh, one half, zero. That's one of them. Let's say, and the other one is uh, one third, one third, one third. You put them into this inequality, and it will be obeyed. So you mean that for an arbitrary matrices, it's yes, true? Yes, it's true, yeah, for arbitrary matrices. It's, it's really mathematics. It's mathem this is mathematics. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I'd like to yeah. see what does it mean, this thing. Why rho v, for instance, is different from rho. If I would put, instead of rho, rho v, and instead of rho v, I do put rho, then it's mm -hmm. also very really good. Then sign should be changed. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, instead of rho, you put rho v. So yeah, you put you put rho v, but you also put rho v yes, here. Rho v, yeah, then it was also true. Yeah. Yes, ah, okay. Technical question. Yeah. You change log rho by the log rho v minus log rho into log of the ratio. Yeah. So these are non-commuting matrices. So yes. Okay? Yeah. So you take uh, yeah you could take the ratio of the matrices. Well. Yeah, that's that's okay. <laughs> well, defi define it to be. Yeah. Well, define it this way. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, I th I think it. Uh, I think it's equivalent because the it's inside the trace and the r the row is outside. Um, okay, so um, what else? Um, right. Okay, so one one more one more comment here is that um, so we talked about the UV divergences. UV divergences are really cancelled separately in the left and right hand sides. Um, there is a second point, which is a uh, somewhat technical point, that actually delta S is slightly ambiguous. Uh, when, um, and, 
and delta k is also slightly ambiguous. Um, when we can, um, for example, because recall that the k is defined as an integral of the stress tensor, and the stress tensor can have improvement terms. Uh, so you can define two stress tensors which whose integral over ho whole of all of space give you the same answer, but the integral over half of space might give you a different answer. Um, and that happens when you, the field theory can couple differently to curve space. So you have the same field, let's say free scalar field, but you couple, uh, you might have uh, an additional coupling of this form, zeta times uh, r. And in this case, then the stress tensor will uh, contain an extra improvement term proportional to zeta. So that uh, is something that you'll have here, that some zeta <laughs> dependence here. But here also, when we compute the entanglement entropy, if we compute it using, um, well, the replica trick and the something called the cone method, etc. Well, there is some way of computing the entanglement entropy uh, in which you have exactly the same ambiguity on the right-hand side, so that uh, the inequality is still obeyed. Um, okay, so that's one issue. And then the species problem, which uh, we already discussed. And we also emphasize the fact that uh, this is general in any quantum field theory. Um, so now, um, <coughs> I'd like to mention just uh, how um, so I think it, it is quite quite nice that uh, the consistency of black hole thermodynamics is automatic in any relativistic uh, quantum field theory and it's a nice interplay between special relativity and quantum field theory and uh, black holes okay. but you already wrote or it's not yet correction to the leading field how does it no, no, this is S, yes. Yes. But if I do write it in terms of area, what do I get? Yeah, so this in general cannot be written as a function of the area. This will depend on some properties of the quantum field theory. So, for example, it will depend on the number of fields. And, uh, number of fields, what else? Uh, the interactions, the couplings, and so and on. The area also acts as zero. Yeah, I mean, it will depend on the geometry in principle, and so the geometry of the black hole enters. Uh, the overall size of the black hole. In, in some circumstances, there are some. This uh, piece contains terms that go like the log of the size of the black hole. You could call them the log of the area. There are terms like this, uh, but there are also finite terms which cannot be written. Like uh, one over eight, there is or no? Let me be more clear. So th this is not just a function of the geometry of the black hole, yeah, it's right? Good, right? It's a function also of the couplings and properties of the quantum fields. And so, for example, even the term that goes like the log of area has a prefactor here, which depends on the types of fields you have. So the number of scalar fields, number of vector fields, number of right. fermion if fields. If you take just one scalar field, yes. three scalar fields, yes. in the sense that it's just related with gravity, yes. then there are no other parameters besides of the geometry yeah. and g mu. And the mass. Yeah. Yeah. The mass. There is the mass of the scalar field. There is, mass, uh, yeah. mass there is this type of coupling. Yeah. Yeah, of course, if you remove all parameters, then it will not depend on the <laughs> no, parameters. But <laughs> no, but, no, but the, the geometry should remain. Right? Yeah, the geometry remains, and it will depend on the, the black hole geometry, yes. And but not purely on the area. So, for example, if you compute it for a, a charged black hole or a neutral black hole, you'll get different answers, zero. which... It yeah. will be logarithmic, something like this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, you go only, there is only one parameter in the game, and it will depend on that one parameter. But no, it can be logarithmic, it can be 1 over a, it can be 1 over a squared, or well, it will be some function. Yeah, it's this function plus some number. There will be a term that goes like log a. Ratios of sizes and so on, or logs, because you don't have a Planck length to play with. Yeah, I mean, it will, this correction will be just some log of area plus some number. Yeah, in that case. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, yeah, so it, yes, yes, yes. So if it, yeah, that's right. That's the, the, it has this infinity, and it will depend on how you remove this infinity and so on. So um, anyway, so, so in yeah, so that, that the infrared there is an infrared infinity here from everywhere else, and you have to deal with it. Uh, 
you could put it in ADS and then you would have a well-defined answer. And there is also a UV infinity here that you also have to deal with. Which, and cancels, the, with the which cancels with the renormalization of G. And the easiest way to do that calculation is to do it uh, a la gibbons Hawking. So you do the functional determinants. Um, OK, so now let me briefly uh, try to discuss how uh, how you can, from here, say some things about the generalized second law. So um, there is a second property of this uh, relative entropy that is useful. So if you have two arbitrary density matrices, and they have some relative entropy, which is bigger than 0. And now you imagine restricting them a little further, so considering obs observables, which are uh, a subalgebra of the original uh, set of observables that define these two density matrices. Then uh, you will find that, um, then you will find that, yeah, let me, let me write it here. So let's, uh, in our, so let's imagine we have two Hilbert spaces. Let's say H, uh, B, let me see, H, A embedded inside H, B. This is sub subfactor of the original Hilbert space. And one way this can arise is if, imagine this is region A, and region B is the whole wedge. And this is a wedge that is displaced by a little bit from the original one. So then in this case, uh, HA will be a subtensor factor of HB. And so if we had some density, two density matrices, rho B and uh, let's say sigma B, so this was the vacuum one, for example, um, then we can uh, restrict them to the smaller uh, factor in the Hilbert space, and we get a rho A and a sigma A. Um, then uh, what uh, we find is that the entropy, the relative entropy between this, uh, these density matrices uh, obeys this inequality. R recall that the, uh, and this is not so easy to prove. This is not as easy to prove as the previous one. Um, this is called the monotonicity of uh, relative entropy. And intuitively what it is saying is that the relative entropy is telling you how different these two density matrices are and uh, how distinguishable these two density matrices are. And what this is saying is that if you re restrict your observations to a subsystem, then it will be harder to distinguish between uh, rho and sigma. Okay? So if you have less information, it should be less uh, easy to distinguish between the two. So intuitively, it uh, makes sense if you think of the relative entropy as how easy it is to distinguish them. So what is sigma? Uh, so these are two, this is true for two arbitrary density matrices, rho and sigma. And relative entropy tells you how easy it is to confuse one, to, well, to mistake one for the other. Um, and here, what this is saying is that if you restrict two observations in a small subspace, it is easier to uh, confuse one for the other. So the relative entropy will be smaller. Right? Yeah, the entropies might, might be, yeah, exactly, yeah. So the entropy of, uh, of rho might be smaller than the other one, uh, but uh, they, they, will, they will look more similar to each other. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so for example, just as a physical situation, so you could imagine that rho corresponds to having some matter that is uh, localized here, right? So here, rho and sigma are very different because there is some matter here. It's, but if you look at here, they look the same because the matter has already fallen in. Um, um, OK, so uh, recall that uh, the, this uh, relative entropy was essentially the, essentially the difference between these two quantities, right? So it was that it's delta k minus delta s, right? And um, so this inequality implies that minus delta s a plus two pi k a 
uh, is less or equal than uh, minus delta SB plus 2 pi delta KB. Um, and, um, and then uh, we can we can rewrite this as uh, so we can pull out uh, the SB here minus SA. So this is the entanglement entropy of uh, the state row. Uh, let's say we do this in essentially Rindler space, and then this could be a portion of a black hole geometry later. Um, and um, then this is less or equal than 2 pi delta KB. OK, so that's um, that we've simply rearranged this. And here in the right-hand side, then, we can use uh, the explicit uh, expressions for those uh, for for this, which uh, involve uh, the involve an integral over the stress tensor. So I'm, I'm now going to write the right hand side here, which is an integral between zero and infinity. Uh, the let me call this direction. I was calling it x plus, but just to be more clear, let me call it lambda. So d lambda lambda d lambda lambda. So that's uh, this one, so that's the modular Hamiltonian of the region B is the integral from here to infinity. And for region A is the same integral but taken from here. So minus uh, the integral between 1 and infinity of uh, d lambda, lambda minus 1, d lambda lambda. Right? So that's uh, this difference. OK. And. Um, now we can uh, use Einstein's equations in the form of the uh, Rachel Dury equation, which uh, says that if we consider uh, a set of uh, null rays, that um, so we consider here some transverse surface and we consider all the null rays emanating from this surface, then um, the, um, the null rays come out from some surface of some area, and then they can either expand or contract. And there is a quantity called the local expansion or contraction, which is as we move in this affine parameter lambda, uh, is the change, the fractional change in the area. That's uh, the definition of theta. And this theta obeys uh, an equation, which is a consequence of Einstein's equations. Um, which uh, has this form. Now, and the important thing is that uh, all terms in the right hand side are negative. Um, this is uh, related to the shear of this geodesics and can be viewed, uh, roughly speaking, as the stress tensor of the gravity waves. So if you have gravity waves, falling into, uh, into this region, you will have a contribution here, which is essentially, like, so it looks similar to the contribution here of the stress tensor of matter. And um, now classically, this is always negative, And this is what goes into Hawking's uh, area theorem. So Hawking's area theorem uh, is essentially the observation that this is always negative, And the expansion in the far future is zero. So we, the black hole reaches some equilibrium, and the expansion is zero. From those two conditions, you can deduce that, um, so in other words, if as a function of lambda at infinity, so, so if, uh, if theta is zero at infinity, and it was always negative, then it had to be positive before infinity. And so that means, positive means that the area is always increasing. Okay? And that's uh, Hawking's area theorem. Now um, we can, okay. Now we want to uh, assume that, but uh, we can uh, simply calculate theta by doing a couple of integrals of this equation. So we do, so if we, so theta, for example, is the is eight pi g newton, the integral between lambda and infinity, the lambda of the lambda lambda. Right? Now we just integrated this equation once and plus something positive that comes from the integral of these quantities. Um, 
and um, then we can uh, calculate the uh, change in the area between here and here by integrating this uh, once more, right? So we integrate this once more, and we um, um, and if we do that integral, so area of a minus area of b is just simply the integral between zero and one, the lambda of uh, theta of lambda, right? Um, and this um, is this eight, well, this is this expression, and we in this expression we can integrate by parts, right? Um, and then we end up with precisely uh, precisely these two terms, okay? By that integral by parts. So, um, so you, yeah. Well, maybe I'll should. Well, pro probably I shouldn't do it. You, you guys. Um, Homework, yeah. That's homework. And the conclusion, what is the conclusion? So the conclusion is that uh, using Einstein's equations, we've uh, related the uh, right-hand side to the change in the area, OK? Um, this was appearing here um, in the right-hand side. And once we, um, once we put this, that in, so what we find is that S, uh, S of B minus s of a is uh, less or equal than the area of a minus the area of b mm, divided by 4g newton. And then we can uh, put this in the right-hand side and this in the left-hand side. And when we have the generalized entropy, uh, of course, the usual area of b or 4g newton uh, plus s of b less or equal than OK, which is the second law. So this is the quantum version of the second law, which includes all quantum effects, including Hawking radiation or uh, any other quantum effects that we could imagine. So not, notice Hawking radiation makes the area decrease, right? Hawking radiation has a negative uh, value for the stress tensor. Uh, but Hawking radiation makes uh, uh, this entropy increase by more than the decrease of this area. Let me say it again. So when you the black hole is Hawking evaporating, this area, area A is less than the area is shrinking. But this entropy is increasing because we have more thermal. Uh, well the, yeah. um, so if initially we, so before, let's say, we had the vacuum at zero temperature outside, and then we are filling it with the thermal radiation, then this one will increase. Um, and similar methods uh, allow you to argue for some other bound, which is the so-called Busso bound, which uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that 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 could well. I was planning to talk about something else in the next lecture, but let me just say finish here. Um, are there any questions? I, I'm sure there are questions. Okay. And lots of them, but there are a lot already. Okay, so we'll finish. Yeah. Let's break now. Thanks. Sure.